This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Welcome to Science on Saturday here at the Bankhead Theater. In conjunction with Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, who produces these presentations and the help of our local educators, this series of science lectures has been very well attended by you, the students. This morning, I'd also like to recognize those people who put it on. I'd like uh, to thank Dick uh, Farnsworth <clears throat> and Marsha McGinnis, who does the graphics. The camera people, the people up in the staff who take, take out their Saturday to come there and help you with this. Well, this morning's topic is understanding climate change, seeing the carbon through the trees. Now, those that were here last week, you've heard this one before, but I get to use it again. Everybody take a deep breath and hold it. Okay, let it out. Everybody here, again, has contributed to the carbon dioxide load of the atmosphere. But what do trees and forests have to do with our carbon problem? Well, to find out, let's take a listen to today's speakers. With us is Dean Reese, a physics and biology teacher from Tracy High School, and Dr. Karis McFarlane, an Ellen uh, Livermore Lab scientist. Dean received his BA in physics and a double major in astronomy from the University of Massachusetts in 2002. Upon completion of his undergraduate degree, Dean decided to move across the country to California to try his hand at teaching and has been doing so ever since. He has received his master's degree at science, of science education from Western Governors University. Karis received her bachelor's degree in environmental science from DePaul University in Chicago. As a college student, she worked as a research assistant studying restored prairie, oak savanna, and woodlands. Her interest in forest ecology led her to Syracuse, New York, where she earned her master's degree in forest and natural resources management at SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. She then moved to the West Coast to pursue her PhD in forest engineering and was awarded her PhD in 2007. Dr. McFarlane works at the Center for Accelerator Mass Spectrometry, where she and other scientists measure rare isotopes like radiocarbon-14. Her work is contributing to the development of a more realistic carbon cycle models that will improve our ability to model changes in climate and anticipate the effects of climate change in, our, in the future. So please give it up for Dean and Karis. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that introduction. And thank you to all of you for being here and sharing your Saturday with us to learn about some really cool and important science. So I study carbon storage and cycling in plants and soils. And I do that because um, I was really interested when I was your age in plants and in ecosystems and in understanding how they work. And what I learned was that plants grow in the soil. They use things from the soil like water and nutrients, and that's really important. So what the soil is like is really important for the plants. And the plants and the soil kind of work together, and that's how we get ecosystems. And that includes all of the animals in the ecosystems as well as the plants in the soil. And they're all related, and one of the ways that they're related is because carbon moves through the plants and into the soils, and then all the animals eat the carbon. So we have carbon moving around in the ecosystems, that's energy flowing through the ecosystems, and through the whole globe. So that's why I do what I do. And why do I do that at Livermore? Well, the Livermore National Lab is really interested in having people like me studying the carbon cycle because it's connected to climate change. And if we want to be able to predict climate change and what the future holds for us, 
we need to understand the carbon cycle. So what you're going to learn today is that the carbon cycle is connected to climate change, that predicting climate change require, requires us to understand the carbon cycle, and that plants and soil are an important part of that carbon cycle. So before we start talking about carbon, I want to see what you guys already know, and we're going to do that with some Jeopardy questions. We have three contestants. Dean, can you introduce them? Sure. <clears throat> so these are three students from Tracy High School. This is Shubit Singh, Tara Chase, and Arpeet Singh. And they're going to be playing Jeopardy. And, and what's cool is, let me see this for one second. You can play right along. So the three questions from Jeopardy are right here on your uh, student notes. So go ahead and uh, participate as well. And we'll see what we know. OK, so the first question is, what does this graph show? A, the greenhouse effect, B, species extinction, C, population growth, or D, global warming? <coughs> All right. Good job. D, global warming. Great. So this graph illustrates global surface temperatures for every year from 1880 on the left up to 2009 on the right. It shows temperature not in just plain old degrees, but in a temperature anomaly. And what that anomaly means is it's a deviation from average. So zero on our y-axis is average. Temperatures that are higher than zero are warmer than average. Temperatures that are less than zero are cooler than average. So we can see the temperature going up over time. The black dots are the average surface temperature averaged across the whole globe for every day of the year, for each year. And you see they kind of bounce around. And that bouncing around is due to the fact that some years are warmer than others. And that has to do with weather. And um, we call that interannual variation. So that's the variation between one year and the next. The red line smooths out some of that bounciness by taking five-year averages. So that takes the average temperature for the year for five years, averages them together. And that shows us a little more clearly the temperature trend. So I want to point out if we start up in the right-hand corner, up in the um, decade that we're finishing up right now, the 2000s, that's the warmest on record. And what I mean by on record is starting from 1880, which is when we started measuring global temperature in a precise way. So this is, this is our record. Um, if we look at the 2000s, that's the warmest decade on record. We go back to the 90s. Before the 2000s, that was the warmest. If we go back to the 80s, before the 90s and the 2000s, that was the warmest. So the last three decades have been sequentially the warmest decade in recorded history. The hottest year, that point that's all the way up at the top, is 2005. So that's the warmest year on record. And last year, 2009, is tied for second place with 2007, 2006, 2003, 2002, and 1998. So if we go back to the last 12 years, our warmest years have been in the last 12 years. Um, OK. So we're going to go on now to our next question. So contestants, get ready. Which of the following contributes directly to global warming? A, the greenhouse effect, B, the hole in the ozone layer, C, overfishing, or D, rising sea levels? A, very good, the greenhouse effect. So the greenhouse effect is very important. And it's when sunlight passes through the atmosphere, so through space from the sun to the Earth, through the atmosphere. It hits the Earth's surface and warms the surface of the Earth. That's why it's warmer during the day than it is at night. That heat is then radiated back out towards space. But as it passes through the atmosphere, it gets caught by greenhouse gas molecules. And greenhouse gases include water vapor and carbon dioxide and methane and a few other things. And those molecules trap that heat. They get excited and they shake. And then they re-emit that heat energy in all directions. So some of it goes back out to space. Some of it stays in the atmosphere and warms the atmosphere. And some of it goes back towards the Earth's surface and warms the Earth. OK. 
So there's something else that contributes to global warming. And that's our next question. What else contributes to global warming? Is it A, humans burning fossil fuels, B, toxic waste, C, deforestation, or D, both A and C? Good job, guys. D, the answer is both humans burning fossil fuels and deforestation. So deforestation is an example of land use change where we take a forest and we convert it to something else. It might be an agricultural field or a pasture where we graze animals. In removing those trees, sometimes we burn them to get them out of the way so we can use the land for something else. That releases a bunch of CO2 into the atmosphere. Humans burning fossil fuels also releases CO2 into the atmosphere. So more CO2 in the atmosphere means more greenhouse gases, means more warming. So let's give our contestants a round of applause. And we have some prizes for them to thank them for helping us out. So when we burn fossil fuels, things like coal, oil, and natural gas, we do it to get energy, to power our cars and for electricity. And what we do is we take a carbon-based molecule, all the fossil fuels are carbon-based molecules, we add oxygen, or in the presence of oxygen, and we burn them to release energy. But a byproduct of this process is CO2 gas, and that CO2 is emitted into the atmosphere contributes to the greenhouse effect and results in warming. And this graph shows you um, the relationship between CO2 in the atmosphere and temperature. So the black and red line is the temperature record that we saw a few slides ago. The um, axis has been extended, so the data has been kind of squished down, but it's the same thing. And in addition to seeing the temperature going up over time, we see that green line going up over time, and that shows us the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, so the at atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration, which has been going up since the Industrial Revolution. And that dark green line is the um, part of time since the 50s where we've been measuring CO2 levels in the atmosphere, and that data comes from Mauna Loa in Hawaii, the lighter green part of the curve, the earlier time period, is the CO2 record that we get from ice cores. So we can go to Antarctica or to Greenland and we can drill in the ice and pull out a core and the different layers of ice were formed in different years. We can pull those out and they have air bubbles trapped in there. We can measure the amount of CO2 that's in the air bubbles and we can figure out how much CO2 was in the atmosphere during the year that that ice was formed. Now that record goes back, I'm only showing you to 1870, but it goes back actually 650,000 years. And if we look at that, we see that up until the last 100 years or so, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere hasn't been higher than 300 parts per million, which is the middle of our axis on the right. So for a very, very long time, going back in Earth's history, we haven't seen as much CO2 in the atmosphere as we see today. Oh. So the other thing I want to point out about the temperature record, which I forgot, is that if we look at the last 100 years, from 1905 until 2005, which is where we are now, if we um, fit a curve, a smoother curve, To look at the average trend over that time period, what we see is an increase in temperature from the beginning of that record to the end of that record to now of between 1 degree and 1.7 degrees. Are you yeah, that's all right. Thank you. So 1 degree doesn't sound like very much. It's 1 degree centigrade. That's 2, maybe 3 degrees Fahrenheit if we go up to 1.5 degrees centigrade. Who cares about one degree? Well, we actually see the effects of one degree of warming already, and we can see that in the melting of glaciers and sea ice, 
and melting permafrost. Permafrost is permanently frozen soil, so that's actually thawing. And the picture here shows the Athabasca Glacier, which is on the Columbia Ice Field in the Colorado, not the Colorado, excuse me, the Canadian Rockies. And people have watched this glacier and figured out how big it is, and they've taken pictures of it. And since the 1800s, the late 1800s, it's retreated back away from us 1,500 meters, which is almost a mile. So we can actually watch these things happening. Other effects that we're seeing already include decreased snowpack. How many people here like to ski or snowboard? So we like snowpack, right? We want snow. Decreased snowpack is no fun. Um, we also use water. All of us in here use water, right? And if we live in the western United States, the snowpack is really important because it gives us the water that we use throughout the summer when it doesn't rain. So we use that for irrigation water to grow food, and we use it for drinking water. So that's pretty important. Um, we've also already observed rising sea levels and an increased rate of the rise of sea levels. So if we live along the coast, which a lot of the world's population does, that's important. Another thing to keep in mind when we, we want to know why one degree matters is that the warming isn't going to stop at one degree. It's actually going to keep rising because CO2 levels are continuing to rise. And the way that we predict how much warming we're going to see is that we use models. We use simulation models to predict what's going to happen in the future. And those models include a series of mathematical equations that include the relationships between a lot of different things on Earth that affect temperature. And some of those things include the um, amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. It includes ice cover. It includes cloud cover, ocean temperature and ocean circulation, the solar activity. So sometimes the sun emits more radiation than other times. And different models will take um, a different approach. They might use different equations to describe those relationships. They might focus on some things as opposed to other things. And that's why we see in this figure different models. Different models are represented by the different colors, giving us different results for how warm the Earth is going to be, in this case in 2100. So that's 90 years from now. That's the end of this century. I might not be around anymore, but you guys might be. And your kids probably will be and your grandkids definitely will be. So this isn't actually that far away, even though it seems like a, a long time. So the conservative models show that we can expect a warming by 2100 of an additional two degrees over the one degree that we've already experienced. So now we've gone from one degree to three degrees total. On the other end, the models predict that we might see as much as five degrees warming from where we are now to the end of the century. So that's six degrees altogether. That sounds like maybe that's a little bit more than one degree, maybe a little bit more important. And that's going to keep causing the things that I just talked about with snow melting and reduced snow packs and the ice melting to happen. It's also going to affect the ocean temperature. And that's going to affect weather patterns. It's going to affect extreme temperatures, it's going to affect droughts, it's going to affect where it rains when, when we have rain as snow, when we have rain as water, liquid rain. And so um, all of those kinds of things added together are what we are talking about when we use the word climate change. So climate change refers to a change in the averages and the patterns of temperature, precipitation, wind, and humidity over time. And all of these things can contribute to lots of changes. And it would be really good for us to understand what some of those consequences of the changes are. Now, the consequences of climate change might be good. They might be bad. They might be kind of neutral. And that probably depends on who you are and where you live. If you're a polar bear, and warming means the Arctic ice sheet melts and you don't have anywhere to live, that's probably a bad thing. Right? Yeah. If you're a farmer in the United States and you live in the northern Midwest, warmer temperatures are going to extend your growing season 
The climate models that we've already run suggest that that area of the country is actually going to get more summer precipitation, so there's going to be more water for your crops. You might do pretty well. If you're a farmer in the California Central Valley and you depend on the snowpack in the Sierras for your irrigation water for your strawberries or your tomatoes, you might be in a pretty bad spot. So it would be really helpful if we could predict what would happen in the future, what will happen in the future, and we can plan for it, and we can react to it, and we can adapt to it. Now, in order to be able to do a better job of predicting climate change and what's going to happen in the future, we need to understand the carbon cycle. And that goes back to what we talked about earlier, with levels of CO2 in the atmosphere increasing because of human activities and burning fossil fuels. And as those levels of CO2 increase, we have more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, we have more greenhouse effect, we have more warming, and then that affects all of these other things that are involved in climate change. So carbon is a really important part of Earth because it's in everything. It's in everything that's alive, it's also in the rocks, it's in the air, it's in the atmosphere, it's in the ocean, it's in plants, it's in animals, it's in you and it's in me. So we're going to take a tour of the carbon cycle. We're going to go through how carbon moves around and where it is. But before we do that, I want to talk about very, very big numbers. So there's a whole lot of carbon on Earth. And when we talk about the amount that's here or over here in the ocean, the amount that moves around, we use a unit called a pedogram. A pedogram is 10 to the 15th grams, so it's a scientific notation unit. It's the same as a million, million kilograms in one pedogram. If we took every person on Earth, we added up the mass of all of us, there are 6.8 billion of us on the planet, all of the people on Earth weigh less than half of a pedogram. If we think about elephants, which are way bigger than humans, one pedogram weighs 150 million large elephants. So 150 million large elephants weigh one pedogram. So it's a really, really big number. It's a really big number of elephants. And that's nowhere near 150 million elephants. So now we're going to go take our tour of the carbon cycle. And carbon is on Earth in a number of pools or reservoirs. Those pools include the atmosphere, the ocean, plants, soil. There's also carbon in rocks in the crust of the Earth. That's our geologic carbon pool. And there's carbon in fossil fuels. So to help you guys get an idea of how much carbon is where, we're going to do a standing up and sitting down exercise. So everybody get ready to stand up. And first, I'm going to start over here. I want my first row here to stand up. So these guys, you all represent all the carbon on Earth. These guys represent the amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere. Thank you. You can sit down. My second row right here, stand up. Thank you. These guys represent all of the carbon on Earth that's in the plants. OK, you can sit down. Thanks. Now I want my first center row right here. Stand up. And these guys represent all the carbon on Earth in fossil fuels. And you can sit down. Thank you. And then this front section right here, the whole section, you guys can stand up. And these guys represent all of the carbon that's in soil. Thanks. Sit down. And this side section over here can stand up, except for the last three rows, I want you to stay sitting. Everybody else can stand up. These guys represent all the carbon that's in our geologic pool in the rocks. Thank you. You can sit down. Now, everybody that hasn't stood up yet, stand up. And you guys represent all the carbon on Earth that's in the ocean. Thank you. You can sit down. So there's a lot of carbon in the ocean. So now we're going to talk about how carbon moves around and between the different pools. So first, CO2 
from the atmosphere goes into the ocean. Some CO2 that's in the ocean goes back into the atmosphere. We have 92 petagrams of carbon. That's like a billion elephants. It's a lot of elephants. Go into the ocean from the atmosphere every year. 90 petagrams of carbon goes back out from the ocean back into the atmosphere every year. We also have We also have carbon going from the atmosphere to the plants. And that happens through a process that we call photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is when plants take up CO2 from the atmosphere. And in the presence of water and sunlight, which gives them a little boost of energy, they convert that carbon in the CO2 into sugar. Some of that sugar the plants actually use themselves to metabolize it and get energy back to keep their cells alive. And when they break down the, the sugar, just like when we break down sugar in our bodies, they release CO2 back into the atmosphere. And that's called plant respiration. Some of the carbon that goes into the plants through photosynthesis goes into the soil. And that's through roots, and it's when the trees drop their leaves and when the grasses die in the summer in Livermore because it's really, really hot. And we don't understand how much carbon that is very well. And that's actually the area where I do my research, is in trying to better understand how much carbon goes into the soil. In the soil, there's a whole lot of little organisms. And those organisms use carbon that was fixed by the plants. They use dead plants, or they use the leaves that fell from the trees for food. So they metabolize that carbon, just like we do. And then they respire. They release CO2 back into the atmosphere. And that's called soil respiration. And then humans do some things, too, that are pretty important on a global scale looking at the carbon cycle. We burn fossil fuels, so we take fossil carbon and put it in the atmosphere. We also do some things to change land cover type. And we call that land use change. And that includes deforestation, so that's taking forests and turning them into something else, maybe an agricultural field or a pasture to graze livestock. And when we do that, we'll take out the trees, and we might burn them to get them out of the way so we can use the area for something else. And that means that we're sending that carbon that was in the plants back into the atmosphere. We also might take a place that hasn't been cultivated, that means it hasn't been plowed, and plow it so that we can grow corn or soybeans or other food crops. And that breaks up the soil. And what that does is it takes the carbon that's in the soil that the soil has protected from the decomposer organisms. Some of that carbon actually gets attached to the soil particles and kind of sequestered and hidden away from the soil organisms that decompose it. So plowing breaks that up. It breaks up the structure, mixes everything up. And the animals, the soil organisms and the soil animals can get at that carbon metabolize it, use it for food, for energy, and then respire it. So then we have more CO2 going into the atmosphere through soil respiration. So if we look at these numbers for our fluxes, and a flux is the flow of carbon from one pool to another, if we look at the numbers, these purple numbers, we have eight for fossil fuel burning, eight petagrams of carbon a year, one and a half for land use change. But photosynthesis is 123. That's really big, right? In the ocean, the ocean fluxes are, are 90. That's a lot bigger than eight or one and a half. But the important thing to know is that the flux of carbon into the ocean and the flux of carbon into the plants through photosynthesis are balanced by fluxes back into the atmosphere. So for the land, photosynthesis is balanced by respiration. So we have to do a little bit of math. And don't worry, I've done it for you. If we take the amount that the ocean takes up every year, that 92, we subtract from it 90, we get 
two petagrams of carbon every year accumulating in the ocean. We do the same thing for the land. We take photosynthesis and we subtract how much we're losing through respiration. We get three petagrams of carbon every year accumulating on land. Through our activities, through burning fossil fuels and through land use change, we send nine petagrams of carbon into the atmosphere. So we're sending nine. Nine of those go up into the atmosphere. Two of them get taken up by the ocean and they stay there. Three of them get taken up by the plants and they stay in the plants and the soil. We tend to think about the, the land pools as kind of connected because they are connected. So we have four left over that are going into the atmosphere every year and accumulating in the atmosphere. And that's where that rising CO2 level, that green line from our graph, comes from. So how do we study the carbon cycle? It's really big and it uses really big numbers and, and um, there's lots of different places on Earth and they're very different. So one of the things that we do is we use carbon models. So these are kind of like the climate models that I talked about already, but instead of modeling climate necessarily, we're modeling the carbon cycle, maybe the accumulation of CO2 in the atmosphere. And those models include lots of equations mathematical equations describing the relationships between the different parts. We can also take the different pieces of the carbon cycle and study them independently so that we can come up with a better way to predict how those different pieces are working and then we can figure out how the whole thing is working. So I do that. I study the land and the carbon cycle and I do it in different places because different places have different kinds of plants They also might have different kinds of soil. And different kinds of soil have different kinds of soil minerals in them. And the different minerals might do a better job or a less good job at hanging on to that carbon and protecting it from the decomposer soil organisms. So now we're going to focus on the land carbon cycle. This looks like the diagram that we went through already. But with the land carbon cycle, we're, we're just looking at the atmosphere, the plants, and the soil. So CO2 from the atmosphere is taken up by the plants during photosynthesis. Some of that carbon goes into the soil. Some of it goes back into the atmosphere as plant respiration. And some of the carbon that's in the soil goes back into the atmosphere through soil respiration. So if we think first about the plants, the plants are taking up carbon through photosynthesis. They're releasing some of it through plant respiration. And the difference is the accumulation of carbon in the plants. And that's called carbon sequestration, plant carbon sequestration. So for those of you who were here last week, you learned about carbon sequestration in the context of power plants and fossil fuel emissions and trying to sequester carbon before it goes off into the atmosphere. Well, plants do that too whether we do anything to them or not, they're doing it. So the amount of carbon that's sequestered by the plants every year is the carbon that's photosynthesized by the plants minus the carbon that's lost as plant respiration. And that carbon that the plants sequester can go into growth, so the plants can grow. They can grow different parts. They can grow flowers and fruit and vegetables. It can also be stored. So the plants, remember, they have to metabolize their carbon, too, to keep their cells alive, to keep, keep them having energy and being alive. And they can store carbon that they fix and turn into the sugar for the winter when maybe they lose their leaves and they don't photosynthesize. So we take advantage of plants doing this every day. We use plant sequestered carbon every day. We use it for food. We use it for fiber, for paper, and for wood, for cotton, for our clothes. And we also might use it as biomass for biofuels to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. We might use it for energy, for electricity, for our cars. The plants store 600 petagrams of carbon. That sounds like a lot. That is a lot over five times as much carbon is stored by the, by the soil. 
And the other thing that's really important about the pool and the soil is that it sticks around sometimes for a very, very long time, hundreds of years or thousands of years. And the amount that's stored in plants really depends on what the plants are doing in the plant's life cycle and lifespan. So some plants don't live very long, only a season, some, some only a year, some of them decades if they're a tree or something like that. But, but the soils can actually hang on to it for thousands of years, which means it's not going back into the atmosphere as CO2 through soil respiration. And it's not adding to the CO2 levels in the atmosphere. So soil has a lot of carbon. Where did that carbon come from? What do you guys think? Did it come from outer space, plants, rocks, or rain? Plants, yay! Well, mostly, almost all of it comes from plants. There's a little bit that comes from the weathering of that geologic pool. So a little bit comes from rocks. But most of it comes from plants. So if we think about the soil pool, we have soil carbon sequestration too. And that's the plant input carbon minus the carbon that's lost back to the atmosphere as soil respiration. So the inputs really depend on the plant carbon cycle. The soil respiration is from soil organisms that decompose and consume that plant carbon. So that depends on the soil organisms and the things that control how much they can do. Things like climate. Now some places, we've realized, sequester more carbon than other places. And some places hang on to it for a longer period of time than other places. And one of the things that I'm trying to do in my research is understand why some places hang on to more, and why the soil in some places holds on to this, the carbon longer and holds on to more of it than other places. And we have some ideas of what factors are really important in determining how well the soil in a given place holds on to carbon. Some of those include the plants. So that includes the plant community type. So if we have grasses or if we have trees, if we have mixture. It includes plant species. It includes the soil organisms, so how many we have and what kind. The soil minerals are also important because some minerals are better than others at grabbing on to that carbon and protecting it from decomposition. Land use and land management are also important. So if we're plowing or if we're not plowing, if we've got um, a pasture or we've got, we have a forest, that's important. Climate is also important. And remember, we're talking about climate change today. So the climate is changing, which means that the way that carbon cycles and is stored in the soil could change over time as the climate changes. Okay. So before we talk any more about what I do, I want to make sure that we all know what soil is. Mr. Reese, can you help us? Sure. <clears throat> okay, so if you think about soil, <clears throat> you're thinking about, to me, I think about dirt. And I think about, well, maybe what's in the dirt? And really, you have rocks, and rocks start off as kind of large objects, and over time they become smaller and smaller and smaller. These, these are rocks that have like whittled down in a stream bed over time. So they're just pebbles now. And there's different colors and there's different minerals involved or inside of each, each of these rocks. And over time, the pebbles can become so small that they actually start to look like sand. So this, this sand actually resembles those pebbles. The colors are, the same colors are there, except, except the particles are just small. So part of soil is rocks and minerals that, that, are, that are inside of the rocks. Aside from rocks and minerals in the soil, you also have organic material, which is what I'm holding here. This is a bunch of debris from a, a dead plant. Um, there's bark inside here. There's leaves, as you can see. There's roots. There's um, wood chips, all different pieces of material that came from a plant. And so the soil, that's where the, a, lot, a lot of the carbon's getting into the soil from plants that originally um, stored that, that carbon as a sugar from photosynthesis. So you have some organic material involved in there. And here's just what happens to that organic material as time goes on. It becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, just like the sand did. 
Um, you also have bacteria that's kind of feeding in the soil, and you also have fungi that's, that's involved in the soil. And water from rain enters into the soil, and kind of it all mixes together to create the dirt that, that you can imagine. So is that all there is to soil? No, that's not all. So we have all of those parts, and they get um, combined together, and we have water, and we also have the air spaces in the soil. That's an important part. And then we have things happening over time that are really important. So one of the things that happens is that the minerals that came from those rocks weather. So that actually changes the chemistry of the soil. Another thing that happens is that the plant organic stuff and the minerals get mixed up. And that's really important because in order for the soil minerals to grab onto that carbon and protect it from decomposition, it has to come into close contact. So mixing can happen in for very long periods of time, very slowly, through rainwater percolating through soil. It can also happen when we have freezing and thawing of soil, which doesn't happen here, but happens in some colder places during the winter. And it can happen in places where we have burrowing animals. So this is a window into the soil, and this window you can see soil getting pushed around and moved around, and that's earthworms burrowing through the soil. So they move it around. They also bring that organic stuff from the plants that's up at the soil surface down through the soil profile. They consume it. They do their business. And they bring mineral particles back up from deep down. So they're mixing everything up. They're bringing that organic matter into contact with the minerals. And that's what lets those minerals hang on to the organic matter and protect it from um, decomposition. So let's mix some soil here. So again, you have some larger rocks, like pebbles. I'm going to put some of that into my little dish here. You have some sand. Weathering causes these pebbles to get smaller and smaller, becoming sand. So we have some sand in the soil. You also have some of the larger organic material, big pieces of bark, roots leaf matter, all that good stuff. It's starting to look delicious. Then the organic uh, matter gets a little bit smaller over time, breaking down. So we're going to throw some chunks of that in. I feel like emerald up here. All right. Oh, let's get that sealed up. And then finally, water from the rain. Pour that in. And you have this delicious mixture <laughs> doesn't that look great okay of soil thank you <laughs> all right so that's soil very cool so I go out to all these different places and I collect soil and I bring it back to the lab and what do I do with it then? Well, one of the things I do is I measure the amount of carbon that's in the soil. That way I can see what places have more and what places have less. I can also do some measurements to figure out what kind of carbon is there. So that's measurements of the chemistry. So what the chemical structure of the carbon that's there looks like if it looks like the kinds of things that we see coming out of plants, if it looks like microbes or bacteria or fungus. I also like to figure out where in the soil the carbon is, whether it's that big chunky planty kind of stuff or whether it's stuck to those mineral particles. And then I also want to know how long it stays in the soil. So I do that for a whole bunch of different places. But you might be wondering if I want to know where it is, in the soil, and soil is a big mixture of that goopy stuff. How do I unmix it? Well, one of the things that I do is a separation by density. So I'll take that mixed up soil that I go and I sample, I collect from the forest. I'll put it in a jar with water, shake it up, and let it sit. And what we find is that the mineral parts sink while the planty parts float up to the surface. 
And we do some things at the lab. We use a centrifuge and we spin it and that encourages all that stuff that's kind of suspended to either float or sink. But I'll take the stuff that floats off, I pour off the water, and then I'll take the stuff that sinks and I have them separated. And I can measure the amount of carbon that's in the floaty part and the amount of carbon that's in the sinky part. Figure out where in the soil it is. And then I can also do radiocarbon measurements on those different parts and figure out how long they've been in that soil. Because some soils hang on to carbon longer than others. And this is what I do at the lab that's really special. I get to use the CAMS accelerator, which we use to measure radiocarbon. We, we use it to measure a lot of other things, but I do radiocarbon. And that helps me understand how carbon cycles in the soil in all of these different places. So when I learn that and I get all this data and all this information, I can give that to the people that make the carbon models for the land carbon cycle. And they can make better equations that do a better job of figuring out how the different pieces are related and how the cycle works. And they can get better predictions about what's going to happen, like how much CO2 is going to go into the atmosphere from the plants as they respire, or how much is going to go back into the atmosphere from the soil as the little organisms decompose the carbon that's in the soil, and we have soil respiration. And once we do a better job understanding that, the carbon modelers oops, can all get together, so there are all these other whole sets of scientists that are working on the ocean. And we can come up with better global carbon models. And those global carbon models can help us better predict how much CO2 is going to be in the atmosphere in the future. We can then give that to the climate modelers and they can figure out how warm it's going to get. We can figure out how warm it's going to get and we can figure out what, how warm the ocean is going to be, how circulation patterns will change, how the weather will change. We can start to really predict what climate change is going to do for us in the future. And if we can understand what's going to happen, we can move farms around maybe. We can come up with different crops to grow in different places appropriate to what the climate's going to be like. We can figure out how we're going to deal with rising sea levels in our cities and what we're going to do about water shortages when the Sierra and snowpack melts here in California. So that's why we do this kind of work at the lab. And that's a big part of why I do it. I think it's really important. But I also really love it because I get to go out to all of these really great places and look at the ecosystems and at the, the soil and sample and learn about how they work. So that's what I have to say about carbon today. And thank you all for your attention and for coming. Thank you.